Let's call on Eamon first uh, because uh, he may give us the, uh, some perspective on what George Marshall might have said if he was here, but also um, some of the lessons from the Burren Climate Gathering in 2013, which was really about this whole issue of how do we create new narratives on climate change. So Eamon, just go ahead. Thank you. Um, George Marshall has a book out, Don't Even Think About It, about why our brains are wired to ignore climate change. I think I'd probably retitle myself, don't even think to try and explain what George is saying in my short, short few words, because he's far better qualified and, and skilled to do it. But I do want, if I can, Ryan, to reflect on our first climate gathering we had in the Burren, in the, Bally, in the Burren College of Art in Ballyvaughan uh, two years ago. George was at it, and I think some of the ideas that from there made it into this book. So I maybe that, from that basis, I can speak with experience uh, having been there. And it was interesting, with people from all over the world, the idea was to bring people to Ireland. Ireland is a meeting place where we would really think in an open way about climate. The fifth province thinking, safe space. Everyone comes as an equal. Every voice is respected. Um, and it was interesting, we had the top people in the world, a lot of top people, climate thinkers, who were, we all agreed in one thing, we're getting it wrong. It ain't working. Um, you go down to a pub tonight afterwards, into the kind of lounge or whatever, and uh, uh, watch a conversation where someone tries to raise the issue of climate change. Oh my God almighty, at that time, I've got to get home. There'll be embarrassed silence as he exit, exit stage left with the pint half drunk. Um, we've made people feel guilty about this issue. We've presented this huge big problem, or presenting what maybe seems to people as tiny solutions that doesn't really get to grips with the problem. Um, We've lost the, the broad public. There's an interest in people in this room here tonight who are interested in climate change or else you wouldn't be here. But we need to win the public. And what we were considering the burn is how we might do that. It was interesting to listen to Karen, and I thought that lesson about listening was probably the most important thing I think I get out of tonight. Because actually we came to the conclusion the first thing we need to do is start listening. Um, to give this up from the environmental movement as an issue. It's not no longer an environmental issue. This is an issue for everyone. And for myself, from 25 years campaigning, I suppose, as an environmentalist, whatever that means, it's, it, there was an agreement that we need to give it up. This needs to be owned by everyone. And maybe, if not everyone, certainly a much wider constituency than what traditionally maybe has seen as having an interest in it. We need to win farmers. We need to build build builders. We need to win students. And we do that by listening to them, first of all asking for help rather than telling them what to do. A certain few things, we took four days of kind of, actually in a fairly creative environment, trying to work out some of our thoughts. Nothing is certain about it. There were certain kind of um, counterintuitive things that we came to, conclusions we came to. One is that we should admit there is real uncertainty in everything to do with this issue. The exact modeling of how climate's gonna hit each particular country, we don't know. The exact solutions, we're not sure, I mean, I have a fair idea myself, I think it's gonna be electrification, electric vehicles and so on, but exactly what technology, exactly which technology, we're gonna to have to evolve this and see. And it was interesting in, in admitting that uncertainty, that argument that we should do in our communications of this issue, there was a fairly common theme that we should be bringing in the artistic community for three reasons. Firstly, they're used to dealing with uncertainty, this long and certain process. The start of painting, it changes as you go through the process. Play music. The tune changes as you react to other people playing. So people from the creative world are used to dealing with uncertainty. Secondly, I suppose this is a broad sense, but where we're going, particularly let's take Ireland as a country we know about. I listen to what the likes of Mark Patrick Hederman down in Glenstore, which is saying, the cue will come from the cultural world. The cue will, the cue will not necessarily, where we go next as a people and as a country won't necessarily come from the economists or the scientists or the politicians for that matter. It may well come from our poets, our philosophers, or our musicians. So we should heed what they're thinking and saying. And last but not least, there was a brilliant Martin Hayes at our climate gathering. And he said something about the nature of conversations that maybe you could learn from music as well. He just a very simple way of uses this fiddle to talk. He says that the, the conversation you could have where you kind of, in music, you start with the melody. Da -dum, ba -ba -dum, dum -dum. And you apply with another melody. Da -dum, ba -ba -da -ba -dum. I got the tune wrong there, I'm a hopeless fiddle player, but you get the idea that there's something in the nature of music that can teach us something about conversation, the sort of conversations we need to have. 
There was other counterintuitive stuff we learned. Um, one most difficult for me is, is uh, that we have to hasten slowly sometimes. That as much as I see the urgency on this and the issues of what we decide to do in the next five years will actually determine what happens <coughs> in the next 50, where our land use, how our farming goes, how our buildings are built, what our energy system. As much as there's a temptation to get it quickly, please, we've got to change. That that sense of exasperated urgency maybe translates into people's ears as a, well, it's like your man is a bit intense. Uh, <laughs> So we need to, the, the, the metaphor we had, someone gave up, right? Uh, so not a metaphor, it's a story they told of the Shannon Air Sea Rescue Helicopter, when they get a phone call, it is a crisis. They gotta get out fast to a boat which is sinking out in the sea. And they're trained, the first thing they do is turn on the kettle. Stop, take a minute. What's the best thing for us to do? Grace O'Sullivan, um, former Greenpeace activist, people will know what she ran for us at the European elections last year. She said, told me something similar. She's a trained lifeguard. What happens, what's the first thing you're trained to do when you're someone's out, I'm drowning? First thing you do as a trained lifeguard is turn your back to the sea. Think, hold on a sec here now, what's the situation, what should I do? And I think in some ways that's very hard for us who've been campaigning on this issue for 25 years, but to just, let's just reflect for a minute. Let's get a think about this and then let's get our response right and go out like a helicopter team that knows what it's doing. Um, two or three other, I won't go into all of them now, they're very Still quick. <laughs> One we spoke of was, we spoke about home narratives. We have to start stopping about the planet but speaking about home, bring this home to people and the, the changes we need to make are, are, are changes to their daily lives and they're better changes than to our lives. And we need to win people whose central instinct is to look after the home. What David Begg said earlier on about his grandchildren, that exists in all of us, left or right, Christian or not, atheist. We have a sense that we wanted to pass on to our next generation the love and the, the environment that we grew up in. So we need to speak about home is one of the things we said. And lastly, we need to speak about plan C, we called it. That if you're stopping people going from A to B, you've got to have a better alternative C. You can't just stop, so you can't go there. We have a better alternative. My last line, where I think George is coming to, he comes to a lot of this stuff in his book. But what is that better way? And, and why do we talk about it? He, he talks about a col more collaborative model, cooperation. I hear this word collaboration all the time now. I read that letter from the Anglican bishops in England to the political system saying that we don't have a choice just between monopoly or competition. Or this, as you say, David, this dominance of narrow competitive view of the world in the last 30 years has got to go. And collaboration isn't, collaboration actually is a better, different way. And it isn't, going back to just monopoly, which state decides everything, it is this new collaborative model between the state and the market, and between all sorts of sectors, environmental movement and others. And it's that collaboration is what I'm most interested in now. I think this, I think this event and this whole series of events is, I hope, an example of such collaboration, where you have it too and Ibeck and the environmental pillar and Schroker and Christian Aid working together. And that's what I think uh, we're reflecting here tonight, which comes straight out of George's book. Thanks, Eamon. One of the things George Marshall uh, is saying, and not only him, but a lot of people in the campaign movement now, is we, need, we made a fundamental mistake the last 20, 30 years in this issue that we concentrated on the emissions and personal responsibility. And actually what he's saying is we should have gone at, from the, at, at the start of the, of the pipeline. So instead of at the end point to the consumer, we should have started with the fossil fuels because we know that they have to stay in the ground, four-fifths of them, and it may be easier for us politically, getting public support, to say, no, sorry, we're not gonna use, we're not gonna be burning peat. That's, and this, this is not popular. Cara August Murray was telling me earlier on today, she put a blog post out last Friday. It lit up because she dared to say that we should, we're, we're, we're gonna have to stop burning turf. Um, but we are, if we're gonna be serious about this issue. And, and, and coal, and gas, and oil. And, and we're gonna have to change that. The same way we, we changed the petrol pumps out of unleaded, we're gonna have to stop the petrol pump. We're gonna literally have to mean, when you drive into a forecourt, that will be the dwindling last option. That option will disappear in the next 20 or 30 years because we will have organized ourselves through the political system to put in the replacement that is now we know available, is becoming available. And so, I, and I think that answers maybe several of the questions that are out there that, 
I think we need to shift from putting this personal sense of guilt. Uh, George Marshall also writes just briefly. Um, he says we can learn from religions about how the way some of these. Uh, how come we don't have some uh, forgiveness space for people here? You know, if you just create this pure guilt feeling, actually it doesn't quite work. You do need some sense we get people out of that and actually on a more positive stream um, that will allow them support the fundamental changes that are needed. Lastly, and I think Terry put it best in terms of how will we get people to do this, I think that sense of pride in being part of a shared undertaking of real scale, that, uh, that innate human instinct, I want to be part of, I mean, for God help us, people went to war. Their sons went off to Gallipoli. And as of that sense, some of them have a shared adventure in something bigger. Could we not have a collaborative shared global venture to tackle this issue? And I mentioned Graham because I, I, I fundamentally think that the shared ambition is that we will feed and shelter and clothe and provide a meaningful, wealthy existence for nine billion on this people on this planet. I think that can be done. That's the big, fill my heart, sense of ambition project, and we've got to do it in one generation. I mean, that's, that's what we've got to do. So that, they don't come bigger than that, but I, 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 think, I think we can do it, and that's what we need to inspire, and inspire people that, my God, Ireland is bloody good at it, because that's when we tend to work well, when we think, like, the reason we're not football hooligans is because we just wanted to prove to them that we weren't British. That they, they're the hooligans, we're the best. It's weren't that we were innately peaceful or didn't drink when we went on the but it was self police sense of whatever you do, don't you dare cause trouble. Well, we need a similar sense about Irish football supporters being Irish climate change supporters. Whatever you do, we're going to be good at this. And it's not as if it's a moral thing where you're watching over every single thing that they do. But no, we set up the systems. So it makes it easy for us to do it without even bothering about it. So what you're saying, Eamon, is we need Jackie's army for climate change, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>